So, let us move on to the physical model. The physical model as the name says, it highlights how the physical structure of the space is when the contextual interview was carried out. In the slide you can see the physical space which has been highlighted of the post office. This is exactly a physical layout, how the post office and the space where the user carried out the contextual enquiry looked like. You can see the various desks and the space where the various executives and the professionals do sit, the entry and exit part, the seating area. So, this is important because the physical space tells us about how entities, objects and the design of the environment has been while the user is performing the activity. Many a time it happens that insight can be drawn that because of the design of the physical space, there has been an issue. And so, redesigning the physical space might mitigate the problem. So, friends, this is in short the five models of contextual inquiry that we discussed. We would now move on to the next part, summarizing the insights from contextual inquiry. Now, how can we draw the draw insights from contextual inquiry? First and foremost, we have to identify areas of breakdown. Remember the portion with, where we discussed about the thundering bolt icon and how due to various influences, a task might not get completed. So, you need to identify those areas of breakdown. You need to focus on attitudinal data. They reveal a lot about users preferences. And finally, you need to focus on areas of increasing productivity, efficiency and effectiveness. So, this was all about contextual inquiry. Now, we would move on to the section of conducting interviews and questionnaire study. Friends, these two techniques conducting interviews and questionnaire study overlaps in a way that both the techniques you need to define and design questionnaires. And then those questionnaires would be given to the users for their feedback. Now, the ways these questions are being delivered are the ways in which it is being named. If you personally inquire these questions to your users, it is often called as an interview. If it is delivered through a printed paper and the respondents are, are asked to fill in the sheet, then it is called a questionnaire study. So, before we start these two techniques, let us quickly see some important points to remember. First of all, anonymity of data. Now, what does it mean? As a survey researcher, we should not be able to identify the participants. Now, data collected in surveys in which the respond respondents are de-identified and all possible identifying characteristics are separated from the publicly available data. This is very important. You will collect a lot of data that might be very crucial for your study. At the same time, it might infringe on the privacy. So, to make sure that these data are safe, first of all, the first thing that we need to do is we need, we need to remove all identifying informations. By identifying informations, I mean information such as name, images, email ID, mobile number and all this kind of identifying informations through which you can relate a piece of questionnaire to that section. This should be removed. Second, confidentiality. While collecting sensitive information, researcher 
need to ensure that identifiable research data will remain confidential and assure respondents that this is the case. So, the second most important part is how do you secure or make sure that confidential data remain confidential. The third part is debriefing. Qualitative feedback is sought from the interviewers and or respondents about interviews conducted and surrounding survey process. It also is used to refer to the process whereby justified deception has been used by the researchers. Now, debriefing can be interpreted in different ways. One way is after you conduct a study, you can have a debriefing session uh, that would actually give you more insight about uh, the nature of the study being conducted, whether there are issues that your respondents have faced has faced. This is one way of looking at debriefing. The other way of looking at debriefing is there are some studies where if you explain the main objective of the study, then your respondents will become biased. They will give you biased answers. Now, in order to make sure that you conduct a debriefing, but you do not disclose the actual objective, a deception is formulated. This is also called a debriefing session. So, initially before you start an interview or a questionnaire, you give an idea of what we are going to do and how you are going to make sure that the data would be confidential, secured and anonymity would be maintained and you give a, you outline the general objectives of the study studies where you think that your users will become aware of and become biased there you create deception or use words and statements in such a way that the respondent will not be able to understand the main intention of this study now criteria for successful interviews now this is the first step of conducting an interview as as uh, as you progress throughout your user study it is very important that for conducting an interview, the interviewer means the design researchers should be knowledgeable. You know why knowledgeable? Because the design researcher should know the focus of the interviews and you should do some background st st study research on that, right. The second important issue is the questions that would be asked should be clear in nature. It means you should use a clear language. You should present yourself very gently. The question should be structured. First of all, you should explain the goals of the interview clearly and then ask for questions if any. And you should be also sensitive towards the respondents. It means you should be a good listener and observer. And you, in a subtle way, you shift your tone. You should be open to criticisms, you should be open to the concerns raised by the respondents and you should have the ability to steer the interview towards its, its logical conclusion. That means, whenever there is a way or an issue wherein the interview is getting derailed because of some questions or statements that are being made out of the context, you should be able to make sure that you pull back the interview on course and finish or take the interview to its logical end. You should be critical in a way, you should ch challenge inconsistencies. That means, whenever respondents are making answers that are inconsistent, that are inconsistent to the positions they themselves have taken in the earlier part of the survey, you should challenge them, but it should not be done rudely. You should be gentle enough to challenge those inconsistencies. You should remember the facts. This is a very crucial piece of uh, directive. You should remember the facts and based on those facts, you should ask and formulate the next part of the questions. Interpreting. Now, this is where 
your insight, your experience, your ability to analyze data would come handy. You have to clarify and extend the statements made by the user. Now, what do you mean by extension? Extension means revisiting the same statements from different perspectives. Remember the change of per perspective that we have discussed earlier. Now, these are some of the guidelines a interviewer should possess to conduct a good interview. Now, we would study in short the various types of interviews. The first interview, first type of interview is called a structured interview. Now, what is a structured interview? A verbal questionnaire in which the interaction is limited by a script and a fixed set of questions. So, you have a fixed set of questions and you know this is your format and you go and ask these questions. Now, when to use this? A structured interview, obtaining general information like demographics, behaviors and relationships, assessing knowledge about a subject, gathering information about stakeholders and their attitude towards the product and process, comparing results across different groups of users on a fixed set of responses, asking specific questions after comprehending the broad issues of a particular domain or product. Now, these are the general areas or the situations wherein you can use a structured interview format. How do you plan the structured interview? First of all, determine the goals of your structured interview study. Why are you conducting this structured interview? Determine whether you will depend on intrinsic motivation to get people to accept your request for an interview or you use some type of ex extrinsic incentive such as money, software or gift certificates to increase response rates. Friends, there is a growing demand of, you, of uh, using extrinsic motivators, but this is a choice you have to make. Many a time industries, academic institutions for sponsored research projects, they carry out interviews or user study with monetary incentives because then you get really get a good quality of data and when there is an in incentive attached, people are serious, respondents are serious about giving good quality of data. Third, list the general questions or the hypothesis that you want answered from the interviews. Fourth, create a pool of questions that address the general questions or hypothesis without defining the particular format of the question. Now, for example, you can ask questions like, for the questions like, I mean if you have an overall question like, how do people prioritize the work that they perform daily? If this is your overall objective of designing or developing questions, your following up questions would be like this. What is the work that you do? How often do you do this work? What are the consequences of the work? Who assigns the work to you? Is there any official prioritization scheme in your organization? Likewise. So, therefore, while you are designing a, a set of questions, there would be one question that would highlight your intention of what questions you are trying to address or seek an answer to. Based on those preliminary questions, you figure out set of questions that would allow you to get answer of those questions. Fifth point, choose your interview questions from the question pool. Select the appropriate question and response formats for each question. So, you can have questions such as fill in the blank, open ended questions, binary means there are two values yes or no like these which uh, extreme values. Uh, a rating scale can be used, a ranking can also be used right and choosing from a list of unordered questions. These are the various formats of questions that you can 
choose or select. Seven, determine the best order of questions. Now, friends, this is very important. The order in which questions are asked or raised can also influence your respondents. The best way to avoid that is to use a funnel approach, where you start with broad general questions and then proceed to more specific questions. So, you start with broad questions, then gradually you move towards more specific questions. Avoid difficult, threatening or emotionally laden questions at the beginning of the interview. Ask most demographic questions at the end of the interview. Organize questions by topic and indicate the topic when you start a new set of questions. Use common spoken language for face to face or phone interviews. Friends, these are some of the guidelines which would make sure or ensure that you conduct a very good quality of interview session. The ninth point is make questions as specific as possible. Avoid abstractions that might be simple for you but complex for your students. Now, this is a very common problem that I have seen across many in many of my design students. Uh, there are terminologies, they use uh, acronyms in a way that, oh, this acronym might my users might be aware of, this terminology my uh, respondents might be aware of. Be very cautious in using those things. Be very specific as if you are explaining certain stuff and avoid as, a, as, as the statement said, avoid abstractions. Consider whether you need to provide a frame of reference. Now, this is very important for particular items. Many questions, ideally, I have seen that do not constitute a frame of reference. The moment you provide a frame of reference, then what happens? The extent of evaluation or the nature of evaluation is very clear when you analyze or decode the data. And the most important part is after all these things, you should pilot test the entire interview process. Now, we will, with this we will move on to the next part. Now, this is the general uh, guideline that I have explained, which is followed across all types of interviews or questionnaire design. It is not only for semi-structured interview, but for all kinds of interviews. You can follow this across all types of uh, designing for interview sessions for any type of interviews and uh, questionnaire study. We will talk about next is semi-structured interview. Now, the general goal of the semi-structured interview is to gather systematic information about a set of central topics while also allowing sub-exploration when new issues or topics emerge. So, it is not completely structured it is not also completely unstructured, it is in between. So, you have some sort of uh, structured questions and you also allow uh, some room for uh, deviations, where you go for explorative uh, uh, sessions to delve deep into the context, wherein you are unaware of that. So, this type of interview involves the use of both open-ended and close-ended questions and can provide both quantitative and qualitative data. Now, when to use semi-structured interview? When we want to gather facts, attitudes and opinions, we use semi-structured interview. When we want to gather data on topics, when the interviewer is relatively certain that the relevant issues have been identified, but still provide users with the opportunity to raise new issues that are important to them through open-ended discussions. So, many a time it might happen that uh, there are contexts, there are uh, topics in which you, f you might as a researcher, you might feel that you have limited understanding or you would like to have uh, a detailed understanding of that is prevailing across your respondents. In those situations, you go for a semi-structured interview. Now, this is the process of semi-structured interview. You have an introductory session with your respondents, where you conduct your debriefing. 
then the structured topics are presented, the structured set of questions are being presented. After that, you raise each topic and you have an open dialogue where you ideally ask open ended questions and look for the answers from your respondents. Finally, you finish all the sessions and have some closing comments, right. Now, this is the overall process of a semi structured interview. Moving on from semi structured interview to unstructured interview. Now, unstructured interviews are conversations with users and other stakeholders where there is a general topic and agenda, but no predetermined interview format or specific questions. Friends, this is very exciting. It means there is no predefined set of questions that you uh, come up with for conducting an unstructured interview session. It is completely open. Now, the goal is to gather rich in depth data about the users or other stakeholders experiences without imposing restrictions on what they can express. So, unstructured interview is conducted primarily when you want to explore a topic. For example, say I am travelling to Botswana and I intend to uh, understand about the market and nature of uh, same as a coffee maker machine. So, because I have limited understanding, I would go and simply ask respondents about their behaviors with coffee making machines. I do not have any predefined question here with me because I have no idea of, of how a coffee making machine uh, is being accepted in the market. So, gathering general data on themes rather than specific questions. So, I have no questions, right? I just go as um, as the situation unfolds, I raise questions. So, it is more like um, questions followed from one section to the other. Develop new insights about the user's interaction with technology. Investigate a new product and get a sense of first impressions and features that catch the eye of the user. Now, this is where the exploratory part comes into play. So, in, in an exploratory research or an exploratory study, we generally focus on the first impressions, capturing the first Im impressions of the end user. Explore a new domain where you are not certain of the major issues facing users and other stakeholders. So, for, so for the example I have given, I have no idea, no clue of the issues that uh, people in Botswana face while using a coffee making machine, right. So, I would generally go there and ask random questions that come up to my mind and start a discussion which is very open ended and this would provide me with rich sets of uh, behavioral and attitudinal data to create a more structured interview format later on. Now, this is the process of an unstructured interview process. So, you introduce yourself first of all then you start understanding the work environment. After understanding the work environment, so how do you understand the work environment? You ask general questions about how do you use this product and what are the primary tasks you do and which tasks you most frequently use this kind of questions and thereafter you ask some ba background on the participant. So, you ask what are the influencers that have influenced him to, to buy this product. So, how does he work throughout the day and where does he fit in these activities, all this kind of background information apart from the main activity or task. After that, you complete the debriefing and the final checklist. So, you debrief this the, the respondents about your scope and uh, objectives and, uh, and see if you can, if you have got those uh, goals being uh, done with the, uh, the, the sense of general exploratory research has been completed with the answers that you have received that ends your unstructured interview process. Moving on from unstructured interview process, now we will discuss about focus group study. Friends, this is a very important study that is being often referred 
by designers and in many uh, industrial organizations you would face, you would, you would see conducting these kind of uh, focus group studies. Now, a focus group study is a qualitative research method where a moderator sometimes called as a facilitator guides a group of 5 to 12 participants through a series of questions or exercises related to a particular topic. Now, the participants in a focus group are chosen because they have been involved with a particular product, service or situation or because they share characteristics relevant to the topic at hand. Right. So, many a time this kind of studies are conducted when the designers or the research group does not have a privy to the large uh, sets of respondents which uh, generally is available for other people. So, they create a team of 5 to 12 respondents and conduct their initial inquiry sessions. So, focus groups are generally held away from the participants home or work sites and last from 1 to 3 hours. A focus group study is rarely based on a single event. Usually there is a series of 3 or more sessions to determine if there are any common and divergent patterns of themes. So, as I said across all studies and specifically focus group study when you gather the data, one of the main observations you would conduct or do is to see the dominant themes or patterns that are being generated across the data. Data. That is where we need to focus on. Now, there are types of focus group studies. There are exploratory fo focus groups which are used when the goal is to elicit and understand general attitudes toward or perceptions of a product or service feature prioritization focus groups which are used when you want to examine what features appeal to your users and customers. Competitive analysis focus groups, it is used when you want to understand what value people see in competitive products or even different approaches to a particular design. Trend explanation focus groups which are used when you try to understand what is driving a trend in user or consumer behavior. Friends, so these are the types of uh, the focus group study as I have explained based on uh, your uh, nature of inquiry. You can decide which one you would like to prefer and when to use and these, these actually the names are different and it, the names tells you about the objective of each focus group. So, it, it allows you to decide on the focus and objective of each you uh, focus group study. Now, when should you use a focus group study? You should use a focus group study to observe attitudes, preferences and opinions on a topic, to understand something about terminology and motivation, information to help you understand confusing results from a quantitative study that you have already conducted, reactions to product concepts, feedback on competitors, general problems with the product or service, descriptions of events that last over a period of time and issues with current products or work environment. See as I was explaining or reading those uh, points, one thing which you can observe is when you conduct an un unstructured interview. It was very open and exploratory in nature because you have hardly any idea of the issues that are being faced by the respondents. But when you come to focus group study, the, the, con, the drastic difference that you observe that you are very clear about your focus. You know the kind of products that you are going to focus on. You, 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 you know that uh, you are going to investigate on the issues that are being faced by the respondents and what are the preferences. So, ideally in choosing participants for focus group study, you must keep in mind that these participants as I have discussed earlier are experienced in nature. They are experiment, experienced in, in a way that they have either used that product or known a product or a service or been in, in those situations earlier. 
right? And that is how you get more insightful and detailed data about their expectations, about the requirements, about their frustrations and motivations of while using a product. Now, this is how a focus group is conducted. So, the stage 1 starts with introduction to the study and warm up discussion. So, ideally it is a table, it is a big table where um, this participants sit along with the moderator and the moderators make sure that he controls, he or she controls the entire session. So, um, then the moderator initiates the uh, general discussions about why everyone is here and what is the purpose of being here and how the uh, discussing the general rules of the discussion, right. And then gradually uh, the first topic and the second topic is initiated, the discussion on the first and second topic is, is initiated. Now, for example, a statement can be made by the moderator and the views across the board of the uh, focus group and the participants uh, can be measured and uh, observed. Similarly, in topic 2 also, uh, once a certain set of discussions has happened, the moder moderator can gradually uh, take the discussion to a different uh, issue and again initiate a set of discussions. After the discussions, an exercise can be planned or given where uh, the moderator might have participants list words associated with the product that is described or shown to them. So, it is a kind of exercise through which they can also interpret, you know, their experience of using a product and list them as keywords that are being used. And finally, feedback and discussion session are conducted. Now, this is in short a focus group study that are being employed across many organizations to study product use, to study experiential part of product use, to study the um, uh, issues faced by the rep uh, respondents while they use a product or continue to use a product. Now, this was all about your interview steps or various types of interviews or uh, and uh, direct observation techniques. So, uh, moving on to now, we will uh, discuss about uh, a few indirect observation techniques and uh, one of them, uh, one, one of the most primary uh, indirect observation technique is the question and design, where you now the idea is you do not go and visit the, uh, the activity or the task where which is getting unfolded in that context, but you rather uh, pre prepare a set of questions uh, and then go on to the respondent and ask him to him or her to fill up the questionnaire. This is ideally questionnaire study. Now, what are the steps required to design a questionnaire? Now, these are the steps. Write out the primary and secondary aims of user study, of your study, the focus, the main objective of your study. Write out concepts, information to be collected that relates to these aims. What are the concepts? What are the constructs? What are the informations which you want? Uh, from your users and how they are related to your study. Review the existing literatures about uh, that have already conducted this kind of studies and their insights and how to identify already uh, you know validated. So, many a time designing a questionnaire is tough, but so uh, many designers do what they take some existing questionnaires and use them in the study. It is also possible, this is also acceptable. So, you can also do that, you can also check for validated questionnaires and you can use them in your uh, study. You can compose a draft of your questionnaire, revise the draft, assemble the final questionnaire, write a detailed list of information to be collected and the concepts to be measured in the city. Now, this is what is important, you have to identify the concepts that you want to be measured by the respondents in your survey on the questionnaire study. Now, identify what exactly are you trying to identify. Are, are, you, are, are you trying to identify attitudes? Are you trying to identify needs? Are you trying to identify behaviors? Are you trying to identify the demographics or some combination of this concept? So, this is very important. So, while before starting designing a questionnaire, you must focus on these features or factors that help you design your questionnaire. Now, for your um, benefit, let us discuss some type of uh, questions 
through which you can design a good questionnaire. What are the types of questions that you can put or use in your questionnaire? Questions like aided recall. Respondents are provided with number of cues to facilitate their memory of particular responses. So, aided recall it means when you ask a question, you provide cues for the respondents to answer that question. For example, cues may be there, there can be a, a memory mark or there can be a landmark. For example, if uh, you are taking uh, two series of interviews or uh, um, you are say, taking two series of question and design, you can ask about a specific event that might have occurred post the last questionnaire that the uh, uh, respondent has filled up, right. Or you can uh, give him specific cue about uh, situation, for example, uh, if you are asking something about market, you can talk about that can you talk about some directions, but necessarily you do not talk about specific uh, items, you talk about uh, generic statements that would provide him with a way of uh, uh, delving deep into those statements and getting some information out for you, right. Aided recognition, a form of it is also a form of aided recall, wherein a respondent is asked if he or she was aware of something prior to being asked about it, right. So, it is an aided recall only as, as it said, but the respondent is asked whether he or she is aware of something prior. So, a prior uh, uh, before asking the main questions, a, state, a question is asked to verify whether the respondent is aware of the situation uh, once there is an acceptance and then the next questions can get followed into. Now, for attitude measurement, there are multi item scales. For example, as it is shown in this figure, if you can see, right, these are the question statements and these are the response items. So, if you can see strongly agree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree, these are the multiple items through which the user can rate in any of the sections, right. So, these are called multi item scales which can be used for attitude measurement. Balanced question, a question that presents the respondent with both sides of an issue. It presents uh, the good part of it as well as bad part of it. Many time I have seen that questions are loaded in nature. For example, they only ask one part of the one side of the story. They do not talk about the other part of the story. When you uh, design a question in that way, in that fashion it, it makes sure uh, that the respondents would be biased. So, your answer to uh, the answer to those questions would be biased in nature. Therefore, to avoid those kind of situations, it is important that you ask balanced questions. Bipolar scales, a type of rating scale characterized by a continuum between two opposite ends. If you see, what do you mean by continuum of two opposite ends? You see these are the opposite ends, extremely satisfied and extremely dissatisfied and there are the ratings, where 0 stands for neutral, right. This type of scales are called bipolar scales. Now, bogus question, this is very interesting. A fictitious question included in the questionnaire to help the researcher estimate, it is also a measure of uh, respondent related measurement error, the extent to which respondents are providing ostensibly substantiative answers to questions they cannot know anything about because it does not exist. See friends, respondents are very smart, they behave as if they know everything. Now in this process of providing answers to your questionnaire, many of the respondents fake a lot of answers to make sure that how do you catch hold of those respondents or their way of answering questions are wrong you can fit in a bogus question. Now, this question is a fictitious question, it does not, it, it does not actually exist, this kind of question does not exist, the content does not exist, but if you see that the respondent is answering those questions also in a very authoritative manner, it, it, it actually makes you understand that okay, this uh, respondent might be faking the answers, right. This is a very intelligent way of figuring out a fake and a uh, truthful respondent. Branching, 
escape pattern technique that ensures that respondents are asked only those questions th that apply to them. For example, you are asking, you want to ask something about car and using usage of car. So, you should first ask that do you own a car? Now, if that respondent says yes, then you can move forward in, in asking those questions. It is an example, you can choose not to design in this way also, but these kind of questions are called branching. Now, double barreled question, questions that ask more than one construct in a single survey. What do you mean by one construct in a single survey? Example, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? What managers in my organization are helpful, but the lack of diversity in the organization is, is disappointing. These are actually tough questions, because there are two statements which we are referring here as constructs are being raised which are diagonally opposed to each other. Now, to think about these questions and answering those questions is really tough and it takes a long time for the respondents to answer those questions. Likert scale, this is the most extensively used scale and preferred by designers. It is a multiple item scale, where each item uses a set of symmetrically balanced bipolar response categories indicating varying levels of agreement or disagreement. So, you can see for example, almonds are delicious. When I say this statement, almonds are delicious and then I end up with um, some um, categories for the respondents to select. For example, uh, strongly agree, disagree, agree, strongly disagree. Now, these kind of uh, uh, respondent statements are considered to be as in agreement or disagreement and, and, and are called as Likert scales. right? Paired comparisons, respondents are asked to choose between a set of items using a binary scale that indicates which of the two choices are most preferred, most pleasant, most attractive or any other judgment. For example, you can see paired, uh, no this is an example of uh, semantics, so we, I, we can discuss about paired comparisons. So, in paired comparisons what happens to uh, items are placed at the end of the scale and they either go towards one direction of selecting an item or an, another direction of selecting an item. For example, if you talk about selecting uh, product A versus product B, so uh, one end of the scale would go towards selecting product A and the other end would go towards selecting product B. This kind of uh, scales are called paired comparisons. And of course, ranking and ratings questions which we already discussed earlier are the types of questions. Semantic differential techniques, this is also a very widely used uh, question format by designers, a type of rating scale for measuring attitudes designed to identify the connotative meaning of objects, words and concepts. Friends, this if you see, if you can see the slide, this is an example of semantic differential scale. Now, if you see all the features of this scale are put into, these are all bipolar, you know it is a bipolar scale only, a rating scale, where the uh, extreme ends of the scale has two semantically different items. So, semantics meaning wise different, which are opposite in nature. So, if you see good, you will see bad, which is you say weak, active, passive, wet, dry, cold, hot, meaningful, meaningless. So, these are all, all semantically opposite items that are being placed across the ends of the scale and then there is a rating. So, either you go towards good or you go towards bad. So, it is a paired comparison only, but not between products or objects. It is a paired comparison between two semantically different uh, uh, expressions, uh, meanings, right. So, this is called a semantic differential technique. So, friends, with this, we come to an end on user study. Now, this is how all the important aspects of user study. Uh, that we have explained, you can utilize in your uh, design process. Friends, keep in mind one important thing is doing in user study is not difficult, but selecting the right technique for conducting a user study is difficult. And getting insightful, meaningful data 
detailed data which are not abstractions are really difficult. So, therefore, choose your technique wisely. We have discussed many techniques, some direct observation techniques, some indirect observation techniques. You need to choose your technique uh, ostensibly enough to make sure that you get a good insight from your user study. Now, we would move on to need and problem identification. Friends, now with this detailed analysis of user study, we will now be taking uh, short spans in covering the next part of the uh, sessions. Now, how do you identify need? If see, while you are conducting a lot of user study, you have a detailed set of data. How do you identify need from those data? The first and foremost point that you should keep in mind is, you need to identify breakdowns and pain, pain points. The moment you identify breakdowns and pain points, those can be considered as need or problem that requires investigation. Identify dominant patterns of frustrations across your user study. If you are conducting a user study for say for 10, 15 people, now across that user study, if you are identifying a dominant pattern of frustrations expressed by your user, then those frustrations are the need or the problems that you need to work on. Identify areas wherein tasks can be completed more effectively and efficiently. Now, while going for user study, while conducting the user study, you have observed across all the users that the, num the, the sequence of steps that are being taken by the user to achieve the task is really, really long and exhaustive. And you feel that it can be reduced to a minimum number of steps or in other ways, right, a minimum number of functions to complete that task or and it, the efficiency can be increased. That becomes your problem statement and need. Identify areas where references are drawn and compared. For example, during your user study, you would realize that many a time your users refers to metaphors, right? Like this product, like that product, like this experience, like that experience. Now, the moment they are drawing references, you know, they are comparing, they are using metaphors. It is an insightful activity because it is telling you that the current experience is not to that extent which they have anticipated. That is an area where you should focus on. So, it is a need and problem identification can be applied to the same insight here as well. Identify points which respondents ignore or misunderstand. Many times you will see there is a product, this is the way the product is used, some of the features they really do not understand. They just you know, skip those features and they use the bare minimum features through which they can complete the task. Those are the areas which are the need, which are can be, which can be considered as need for your uh, design process or problems for your identified problems for your design process, right. So, friends, these are some of the uh, insights which I have discussed through which you can identify uh, your need or problem statement. Next, we will move on to market study or product study. Friends, earlier while discussing about user study, we discussed about a session of competitive analysis. You know, market study or product study is very important. Why? It is important because it allows you to see your competitors that your respondents provide or that govern your respondents. You need to break that zone and become the first choice of your respondents. So, unless and until you study your competitors and how and why they are dominating the market, you will not be able to design a product that will break even into the choice of your respondents or users. So, Market study and product study can also be called as competitive analysis. You analyze products in the market based on some factors 
and you evaluate the features, the extension to which are being preferred by the respondents. I will provide you with a list of table. You can see the table here. This is the table where you can stack competitor 1, competitor 2 and competitor 3 in the rows, rows 1, 2, 3. And this is an example. You can design your own features list as well. And these are some of the features that can be used. You can identify the primary tasks, right? You can identify the secondary tasks of the product that the product does, price of the product, the unique features of the product, material used for uh, construction or uh, developing the product, color of the product, form of the product, strengths and weakness of this product. And these are in general some of the features or the characteristics based on which all these products. So, this is one product, this is the second product, this is the third product, these products are compared. And once you compare them, you would be able to have a detailed observation or detailed insight on which competitor, which product has unique features, which one do you want to take, refer to and want to extrapolate from that uh, part, right. So, this template can be created by you also. You can also come up with these uh, features, right, or you can also use these features which we, we have just explained and conduct your competitive analysis or market study or product study. Now, drawing insights from market or product study. Draw insights from your competitive analysis. Create a benchmark. You have to create a benchmark of the main and unique selling propositions in such a way that your product must have these bare minimum features that dominates the market. See, if you blindly start designing a product, you might lose or you might never be able to appreciate that feature, those features which dominate the market, right. You have to identify those features. So, competitive analysis allows you to identify those features and use these findings to define the design brief. Now, this is where we will talk about design brief. So, what is a design brief? A design brief is a statement, a design brief is a statement that outlines the scope of the project, its goals, its objectives, its de de deliverables, its timing, budget, etc. So, in short, it is a blueprint of the entire project. What are the goals? What are the objectives? What are the process to be followed? Who are the stakeholders? The timelines, the budget, price, everything. In, in short, not in detail. It also states the direction in which the conceptualization process for innovation should proceed. For example, from your user study and your comparative analysis, it says that the, the, the market lacks products that has considered serious human factor related issues. Aesthetically, products are good. They have good functions, but when it comes to human factors, the products lack. So, so, for you, the objective is to come up with a product that has a richer consideration of human factor attitudes and preferences into it. So, it also now states the direction in which your conceptualization process should move. It involves drawing insights from user study, market study, product study and clients to define it. So, if this is in short about design brief what should design brief consists of or what should it have? First of all, it should have a background or motivation why this product or this concept is important, its goals and key objectives, who are the target audience, what are the purpose and function of the product, the timeline and deliverable, uh, design, it should talk about the design and development process and how would you measure the success of the product. Right? So, this is in short what should consi constitute a design brief. Now, we would move on to personas. Friends, this is a terminology which might be very new to all of you. For designers is one of the most preferred terminologies, personas. Now, why personas are required? See, 
during user study, designers investigate tens and thousands of users. So, it is not possible to keep in mind or remember each one of them while the designer conceptualize a product for them. So, therefore, what designers do? They aggregate those users and the dominant features that are being observed in among all those features are taken, constituted and a fictitious person is created that represents those dominant features. This is called a persona. So, personas are fictional characters created based upon user study in order to represent the different user types that might use your service, product, site or brand in a similar way. Creating personas will help you to understand your users needs, experiences, behaviors and goals. It can help you to recognize that different people have different needs and expectations and it can also help you to identify with the user you are designing for. Generally, there are three types of personas. One is goal directed personas specific to tasks. So, you only talk about the dominant tasks that you have observed across your users to when the task is being defined that is called a uh, goal directed personas, role based personas. So, role based personas are, are uh, also goal directed personas, but then it has a lot of background information being presented uh, into it. Third one is the engaging per personas. So, when you combine goal directed and low role based, it is called uh, engaging personas. Many a time, generally designers use engaging personas. I will show an example of an engaging persona that I've been used. So, uh, this is a persona. So, I have created my own image. Uh, for your reference, but you can use any fictitious image. See the personal profile is being mentioned here and a brief about what he does, uh, what he does. Now, the, remember this is a profile of a buyer of an SUV. So, uh, who, he, who he is, who he is and um, his basic descriptions are given here, right. Basic descriptions are given here. His requirements are stated here and this background and his attributes are stated here and these are some of his preferences or features that he likes. Right? Now, this is called a persona, right? engaging persona. Now, based on this, the designer starts the conceptualization process. Now, after personas are created, it is very important that you also create a scenario. Now, what is a scenario? A scenario is this. This is one of the drawings of one of my students. So, a scenario as it says, it illustrates the way a current activity is being performed. Okay. So, you can also use storyboards like this can become one of the story board, right? this can be another storyboard, this can be other storyboard, right. This can also be taken as another storyboard or this can be another storyboard. So, like this you can also segregate boards and create content inside it. Here my student have not done it. So, here this is a storyboard of how a bottle like this can be opened or opened and refilled, right. So, he has talked about the steps right these steps how it is being opened and then how the levels are being observed and then how it is taken out and then how it is being used right this is a scenario so a scenario is a description of how a product is being currently used now these types of scenarios are often called scenarios without design intervention Once your conceptualization process is over, then you can come out with the scenario that can be called as a scenario with design intervention, right. Now, these are the two types of scenarios. So, so basically friends, scenarios provides you a detailed, a visual way 
a visual depiction of how an activity is performed, how a product is being used in uh, or by your users. It is a visual way of depict, depicting the uh, um, product use, right. So, these are some of the important things and things that should be considered in the design process. So, with this we have come to the end of uh, module 2. So, in this module we have discussed about various user studies, techniques for conducting uh, observational user study and uh, indirect forms of user studies. We have also talked about uh, personas, scenarios, design brief, uh, requirements and need uh, identification and also we have talked about uh, market and product study. So, this in short completes your module 2. Uh, my colleague would take care of those next modules which would go in deep into the uh, other facets of design process. Hope uh, you have received a brief idea of uh, the uh, discussions and you, you can utilize uh, these topics in your design process as well. Uh, thank you for being part of this course. Thank you.